This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Leaders of the Western Military Alliance NATO gather for talks in Brussels. South Africa to dispose of 2 million contaminated Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And Nigerian President Buhari acknowledges the government's failure to fully tackle insecurity in the West African nation. Welcome to Africa Live on CGTN with me, Beatrice Marshall in Nairobi. The details on those stories in just a moment, but first, here's Rama Nyang with today's business headlines. Rama. That's right, Beatrice. Here's what's coming up in business. The African Development Bank launches a kangaroo bond as it marks its return to Australia's bond market. And Ethiopia commences a tendering process for the sale of 40% of the state-owned telecommunications firm. We'll have the data and the details on those stories and plenty more coming away in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Beatrice. Rama, thank you. Leaders from the North Atlantic Treaty Organization are gathering in Brussels for a summit, the first since Joe Biden became U.S. president. The in-person gathering comes ahead of Biden's first face-to-face -face meeting with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, and follows the G7's three-day summit in England. Tony Waterman has more. They want to put a sharper focus on Russia and on China. They want to invest in new emerging technologies like AI. And for the first time, they are going to recognize climate change as a threat to the alliance. Also high on the agenda is Afghanistan. Some NATO allies uh, were uh, made it very clear that they were frustrated over Biden's decision in April to withdraw the troops uh, after 20 years. They are looking for more details on what this is going to look like. They're also going to be discussing uh, China, which of course is a rising power in the world, not just economically, but also militarily. And, you know, it was just 18 months ago that China was mentioned for the first time in a NATO communique. Uh, the last one was just one sentence on China and Stoltenberg said that it would be a much longer, more robust statement this time around. But he also acknowledged that he needs to work with China on certain issues. Take a listen. We're not entering a new Cold War, and uh, China is no, not our adversary, not our uh, enemy, uh, but uh, uh, we need to uh, address together as an alliance uh, the challenges that the rights of China poses uh, to our uh, security. And obviously this meeting coming just fresh off the back of the G7 summit in the UK over the weekend where we saw the leaders uh, unveil an infrastructure plan that could rival China's Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, a bit of a turning here when it comes to the relations. But their challenge now is getting everybody on the same page going forward because obviously every nation has their own agenda when it comes to China. South African pharmaceutical firm Aspen Pharmacare says it will release approximately 300,000 fresh doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine within a week to bolster the country's vaccination drive. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has cleared the fresh vaccines to South Africa after it had to dispose of 2 million contaminated doses. South Africa is experiencing its third wave of COVID-19 infections. 7,657 new COVID-19 cases have been identified on Sunday. Angelo Coppola has more. This brings the total number of laboratory confirmed cases to over 1.75 million, with Gauteng providing the majority of new cases at 64% of the total on Sunday. People are getting vaccinated, but the announcement that 2 million doses of the Janssen J&J vaccine available to the country can't be used has put a break on the rollout campaign. People are still being vaccinated with other available vaccines. One, so I can get back to living my life, so I can meet my friends, go out and to be safe again. And also it's to protect everyone else. If I get vaccinated, that's one less person. I'm one less person that can infect a whole bunch of other people. And if more people get vaccinated, less people get to be infected. For my health and my safety and also to uh, protect my, my parents, my in-laws, my elderly people that I'm around to make sure that they're safe as well. And if I keep myself safe and healthy, then they're safe and healthy. While South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has indicated that Aspen, the local manufacturer of the J&J vaccine, will commence work on the replacement vaccines this week, there are people who are choosing not to be vaccinated. 
I do believe it's a personal choice and people might have their, their reasons for not being uh, vaccinated. But on the flip end, I also do think if they think of the greater uh, benefit to the rest of the, the population that they live within, it is a rather selfish uh, thing to do. The latest data shows that 951,000 healthcare workers have been vaccinated, while in phase 1B, 2.54 million people over the age of 60 have been vaccinated. There is some good news. Approximately 300,000 doses from batches that have been cleared by the US authorities that meet the requirements will subsequently be released and shipped to South Africa. The removal of those 2 million doses from the healthcare inoculation system is a major setback for South Africa. It's unclear when that's going to be caught up. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo say a spike in COVID-19 cases has overwhelmed health facilities in the capital, Kinshasa. The city has lately been recording more than 250 cases a day, the highest daily total since the pandemic began. The country's president, Felix Shisekedi, has warned that he may be forced to take drastic measures to curb the spread of the disease. CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has more from Kinshasa. The DRC is currently battling the third wave of COVID-19 infections. Health officials say the Delta variant that was first detected in India has been spreading fast across the capital, Kinshasa. The rise in cases has overstretched hospitals around the city. Many of them are ill-equipped to deal with the increasing number of patients. We have been recording more than 200 COVID-19 cases in Kinshasa on a daily basis. The numbers have really shot up. Hospitals are only treating emergency cases. Health officials have registered more than 35,000 COVID-19 cases across the DRC since the pandemic began in March last year. But 25,000 of them have been recorded in Kinshasa. The situation has been worsened by people's laxity in observing health measures aimed at preventing the spread of the coronavirus. President Felix Chisekedi said he is considering taking drastic measures to limit the spread of the disease. The DRC delayed its vaccination campaign in March this year over fears about side effects caused by the AstraZeneca vaccine. It rolled out its vaccination campaign in April, but there has been a low uptake of the AstraZeneca jab. Only 33,000 people have been vaccinated out of a population of over 80 million people so far. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN. Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari has acknowledged his government's failure to completely end violence and insecurity in parts of the country, but said his administration has succeeded in overcoming some of those challenges. Buhari's statement comes as the West African nation commemorates 22 years of civilian rule. As CGTN's Kalechi Mekalam reports, continued violence and deadly attacks have posed huge challenges to the country. We have witnessed and overcome a good number of testy challenges that would have destroyed other nations, especially relating to our collective security. Nigeria's security challenge featured prominently in President Muhammadu Buhari's televised address to citizens on Democracy Day. Let me assure my fellow citizens that every incident However minor, gives me great worry and concern. Some Nigerian criminals are taking undue advantage of a difficult situation. President Buhari assumed office in 2015, promising to end insecurity. But six years down the line, insecurity continues to threaten Nigeria's political and economic stability. From kidnappings to communal clashes and the decade-long Boko Haram insurgency, this despite the government's earlier statement that the militant group had been technically defeated. They actually underestimated the sec security challenges when they came on board. Uh, they also underestimated the, the level of uh, the extent of the acceptance of the Boko Haram philosophy in the, in the Northeast. And what that has done is it, um, it has weakened the security architecture completely. Within, within the region, which now has spread to the other part of the country. The situation has worried many who've taken to the streets to protest against what they see as government's inability to end the crisis. 
Experts blame this on several issues, including insufficient security manpower. A country of almost 200 million people, you are looking at, um, you are looking at a police force of about 300,000 to police a country of almost 200 people. The way the government, the security system is set up right now cannot address the challenges that we have. They either revamp the security architecture or they need help. You know, and so, but uh, previously they kind of play politics with it, you know, thinking, going out to, to ask for help is showing that you have failed. But the evidences are there that the system has failed. More than 30,000 people have been killed and millions displaced from their homes by Boko Haram attacks. Kidnapping for ransom has also been on the rise, with learning institutions becoming easy targets for the criminals. More than 800 students have been kidnapped since December. Nigerians have asked government to deal with the rising insecurity, even if it means seeking help from the international community. Kilechi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. Meanwhile, Nigeria is faced with a deficit of 1.7 million pints of blood each year in its reserve. This is according to the Health Ministry. As the world marks uh, commemorates Blood Donor Day, the Nigerian government is stepping up efforts to close this gap. Our correspondent, Philly Haza, reports from Abuja. Japhet Ezekiel Michibi walks on crutches and calls himself a warrior of sickle cell disease. His condition requires a blood transfusion at least once a month. He says it's been traumatic accessing blood at the hospitals and almost cost him his life in his 20s. So normally my elder brother, uh, he's the one that matches my blood group, he's my donor. But as at this instance, he wasn't in town and uh, there was no blood in the blood bank. But fortunately, uh, we got a donor and I lived through that moment. But even after that, nothing major has changed. There's still difficulty accessing blood. According to Nigeria's health ministry, up to 1.8 million units of blood is needed for transfusion every year, but only about 66,000 units are collected annually. The National Blood Transfusion Service says only 5% of total blood donations in the country are made by voluntary donors. The remaining 95% are commercially provided. The religious beliefs, some don't collect, some don't, some don't collect, some don't receive. That's their belief and nothing changes it. We have people that are you know, the awareness is very low, you know, because people say they don't see it. And the radio stations will do it, but, you know, it's not frequent. We need to make it frequent. That's it. And we have people that are afraid of needles. Afraid of prick, needle prick. They're afraid of it. They don't want to do it. There are cultural beliefs. People are afraid that they have blood going to be for rituals and so on. It's unfortunate, but that's the truth. Experts at this blood drive to mark World Blood Donor Day say more awareness is necessary. They say the COVID-19 pandemic has made the situation worse. So, as well as TV, radio and social media promotion, they're also using on-site locations. Nobody wants to leave his workplace. Where he's, where he's making money to feed his family, he can't donate blood. When we come here, that issue is settled. We come to donate blood and then close their business. So, it's, it's all a lot of things. That's why we're here. I believe that if we continue this way, by the time more people join the trend, the awareness increases, the donation increases, and then I believe the... The scale will be scaled up, but the gap will be closed. It may, it may not be totally, but with time, with little by little, you know, we'll get there. And the country may be on its way to achieving blood self-sufficiency. Last year, the government launched a 10-year national blood transfusion strategic plan, which is targeted at reaching at least 1 million blood donors yearly from 2021 to 2030. It says this will improve the nation's safe blood reserve. And that should mean people like Jaffet can access blood more easily and many more lives can be saved. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. Ethiopia has once again dismissed reports of famine in the northern region of Tigray. The head of the National Disaster Risk Management Commission, Miti Kukasa, says the government and international aid organizations are providing food, water, fertilizer and selected seed to the most vulnerable people in the region. Here is CGTN's Gerum Chala with more details. Ethiopian authorities estimate that 5.3 million people, that is 90% of Tigray's population, need emergency food assistance. But they have termed a report by the UN that there is famine in the region as inaccurate. 
The National Disaster Risk Management Commission says the report has even undermined the work of international agencies which are currently handling more than 90% of aid services in Tigray. Regarding food supply and distribution, World Food Programme WFP addresses 18.18.3% of the beneficiaries. World Division addresses 5.80% of the beneficiary. Care International address 6.28%. REST address 54.6%. FH 5.98%. Government Ethiopia 8.7% of the beneficiary. In general, Himata partners, the five operators, covered 84.9% of Zawradas and addresses 91.3% of the food supply and distribution. Whereas 50.05% of Zawradas and 8.7% of the food supply and distribution is covered and addressed by the government of Ethiopia. The commissioner said the government has moved to support agricultural activities in the war-torn regional state through continuous provision of fertilizer, selected seeds, and other technical assistance to farmers. Additional supports are undergoing with the coordination of regional agriculture and natural resource bureaus, 322,864 quintal of fertilizer from Port Djibouti, and 214,864 quintal carryover from last season, a total of 537,728 quintal fertilizer has already made available, and 210,795 quintal distributed. Regarding seed supply, 73,440 quintal has been purchased and transported to, to the region. Partners has allocated per 71.9 million for livestock restocking. Earlier, the Ethiopian Minister of Foreign Affairs had condemned the report, warning that comparing the current situation to the 1980s famine is unacceptable. Ethiopia's government says it has given aid agencies a conducive environment to operate in. The role of the government is confined to monitoring, creating conducive environment for partners, and mainly focusing on recovery and rehabilitation activities. This shows how the government of Ethiopia has been working closely with partners and creates conducive environment for Rimatan partners. The Tigray regional state is now being administered by the provisional leadership assigned there. According to observers, major cities of the region like Mekele are slowly returning to normalcy. Still, conflicts in pocket areas take place every once in a while, even claiming the lives of people in different posts. Group Dallas UTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And we still have more news for you here on the program. To stay with us. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared, enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. At the end of the weekend summit, the G7 made a broad range of commitments from how to deal with climate change to commitments to donate COVID-19 vaccines. But some international organizations point out that the group's commitments are overdue and far from enough. Overall, we judge this as a historic failure to really rise to the challenge of our times. This huge emergent health emergency that we're facing, this huge climate catastrophe, they really haven't stepped up to the mark and, and I think everyone, for, it, for everyone it's plain to see that this has been a failure. 
The G7 leaders have pledged to provide 1 billion doses of coronavirus vaccines to less developed countries over the next year. Campaigners, however, are critical. It's quite interesting to see how they think that 1 billion doses for one year would actually end the pandemic. That's really funny because that would not even take care of 5% of the population. And so it's kind of disappointing because the whole world was really looking up to this richest country that come together, hoping that they could mobilize as, as, a, as a group, you know, to really try to end the pandemic on time. Because the longer it stays, of course, the whole world suffers from that. We need 11 billion doses. We don't need a billion. And even the billion, they're cooking the books here. I mean, it's, it's just a fudge. So uh, it, it, it's not enough. It's absolutely not enough. And not just Oxfam, the WHO has said we need far, far more. We need them now. And we also need them to share the intellectual property. Developing countries need the rights and the recipes to make their own vaccines, not relying on the charity, the largesse of the G7. So it's completely inadequate on uh, battling the coronavirus crisis. Meanwhile, this year's G7 summit communique has touched upon several issues concerning China, to which a spokesperson from the Chinese embassy in the UK replied. Our reporter Sui Hui Yao in Beijing has the details. The Chinese embassy in the UK responded to some major allegations on China made by the G7 communique. Uh, first, the Beijing criticized the G7 leaders' call for a review of the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Chinese embassy statement pointed out that politicians in the United States and certain countries ignored facts and science and negated the conclusions of the WHO experts group report earlier this year. Uh, it says those ac accusations against China are unreasonable and are political manipulation. Forward, Beijing says it is willing to continue cooperation with the international community, uh, but says origin tracing should be conducted from a global perspective, meaning not just focusing on China alone. And on China's human rights conditions, earlier White House officials said uh, the U.S. President Joe Biden wanted the G7 leaders to speak in a single voice against China's labor practices in Xinjiang. And now the Chinese embassy in the U.K. said the G7 communique distorted the facts and deliberately slandered China and interfered in China's internal affairs. And with regard to the rule-based international system, uh, China has reiterated that there's only one set of rules and there's only one system that the rules are set by majority, not the minority. Uh, it said world affairs should be handled through consultation by all countries and global decisions cannot be dictated by a small group of countries anymore. It is widely known that Africa is endowed with vast resources. The struggle for control of these resources has raged on since colonial times and continues to this day. The West has been on the spot for invading poor nations to access their natural resources, but there's little evidence of the West's attempt to develop the continent. For instance, recently it emerged that the UK aid to African countries could be cut by up to 66%. Wilkis Anyabwa reports. On Saturday, leaders of the G7 countries, some of the world's largest economies, unveiled an infrastructure plan for the developing world. The G7 partnership, dubbed Build Back Better World, aims to finance development projects in developing countries, Africa included. But though the promises sound promising, they are prefaced by a history of the West crumble for control of Africa's resources, which has often left the continent disenfranchised. The struggle for control over Africa's natural resources has raged since the colonization of the continent. South Africa's potential mineral wealth, for example, is estimated to be around 2.5 trillion US dollars, while the mineral reserves of the Democratic Republic of Congo are thought to be worth 24 trillion US dollars. The onset of colonialism saw African economies destroyed and fragmented. African countries became providers of raw materials such as unprocessed minerals, timber and agricultural products for the development of other countries. It continues today as the forces that undermine Africa shift from the former colonizers to Western transnational corporations. A 2017 report by a coalition of UK and African equality and development campaigners, including Global Justice Now, found that more wealth leaves Africa every year than enters it. The key factors contributing to this inequality include unjust debt payments and multinational companies hiding proceeds through tax avoidance and corruption. 
The report argued that the prevailing narrative where rich country governments say their foreign aid is helping Africa is a destruction and misleading. It has further emerged that UK aid to individual African countries is being cut by 66% this year. And as the G7 countries mull over the infrastructure project, some experts say transforming aid into a process that genuinely benefits the continent could be more beneficial. And now back to you. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the ruling Communist Party, Egypt's former Minister of Antiquities, Mamdou El Damati, speaks with Yasser Hakim about his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping during his visit to Egypt in 2016. I met the Chinese president in 2016 on the 60th anniversary of Egyptian-Chinese cultural relations. We were honored by the visit of President Xi Jinping to Egypt. There was a wonderful celebration at night inside the Luxor Temple in Luxor City. The Chinese president attended the celebrations with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, the Minister of Culture, and myself as Minister of Antiquities. This was my first meeting with the president and I was honored to explain to him the history of the Luxor temple before the celebrations began. The impression I had of him is that he is a well-cultured man who loves civilizations. This was clear in our second meeting the next day where we spent more time because we visited different sites in Luxor city. We visited Karnak temple, the Hatshepsut temple, the Valley of Kings, and we entered the tombs of Tutankhamen and King Ramses VI. He was fascinated with Egyptian civilization and asked many questions. This shows the passion, knowledge and information the Chinese president acquires. I remember the night before, in Luxor Temple, he told me I have a lot of questions for you in the coming days. China is also a country with a big civilization and a unique culture, and therefore, it's obvious the president of such a nation would be so well-cultured and knowledgeable. The developments are continuous in China and have picked up during the presidency of President Xi Jinping. You know, Egypt is the first country to recognize the People's Republic of China in 1949, and the bilateral relations, political, economic, and cultural have been strengthening and developing. And on Thursday, Egypt held an exhibition dedicated to Gaza's reconstruction efforts. The Cairo Construction Hub is a four-day event which brought to together developers and politicians to discuss the most pressing needs for the Palestinians. Egyptian cabinet members also held talks with their private sector representatives on the essential projects that the Gaza Strip needs. Here is Adel Mahroui with more details. On June 4th, Egypt sent a convoy of engineering and building equipment to Gaza to prepare for this trip's reconstruction. Cairo sent some 50 bulldozers, cranes, trucks and other construction vehicles through the Rafah passage to begin clearing the destruction debris. This week, the Egyptian capital held a construction forum aimed at including the private sector in its plans to rebuild the Palestinian Strip. We thank the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, and thank Egypt, our big sister, for this generous initiative, which is the first of its kind for Gaza's reconstruction. The Gaza Strip is in need of immediate aid in all fields, especially in infrastructure, electricity grids, water supply, roads and other vital services. We're still waiting for details on the projects which need to be implemented in Gaza. What are their sizes? What needs to be done? Officially, that hasn't been finalized yet. Already, Egyptian companies are visiting the Strip to understand the volume of the work that needs to be done. In May, Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi pledged $500 million for Gaza's reconstruction. The initiative followed Cairo's successful ceasefire deal that ended 11 days of hostilities between Israel and the Palestinian armed resistance. Egyptian companies will lead these rebuilding projects. Egypt has 65,000 construction-related companies. We don't need all of them to participate in reconstructing Gaza. 
the Gaza Strip is estimated to require some $10 billion to recover from the destruction recently inflicted. We have the details of the destruction tally. The Cairo Construction Hub is a four-day forum that tackled the opportunities Egypt has in rebuilding Gaza. While the Palestinian Strip was the focus this week, companies also discussed the potential they have in working in other Arab nations. Egypt has a regional edge which makes it capable through its contracting companies to provide expertise to the region. We have the ability to help in developing neighboring countries like Libya and Syria after security stability is reached. We have already begun participating in projects in Iraq. According to officials in Gaza, the 11 days war with Israel left nearly 20,000 buildings either completely or partially destroyed. A Palestinian cabinet delegation headed by Deputy Prime Minister Ziad Abu Amr arrived in Cairo on Sunday. Their prime task is to agree on a coordination platform between the Egyptian government and the Palestinian Authority to ensure that funds dedicated for Gaza's reconstruction are channeled properly through the Palestinian government rather than Hamas. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Rama Nyang is here with the day's business news. Rama. Thank you very much. Peter says what's coming up in business. The African Development Bank taps into the Australian bond market. We'll have the details. And Ethiopia rolls out the tendering process for the sale of a 40% stake in its state-owned telecommunications firm. taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Welcome back to the program. The African Development Bank is marking its return to the Australian dollar bond market through a 600 million Aussie dollar note. That's roughly $464 million worth of a 5.5-year kangaroo bond. Now, the transaction was announced on the 8th of June. The sale was led by Nomura and RBC Capital Markets. It's the institution's first benchmark kangaroo note since early 2018. And it's the first in the mid-curve since 2015. It's also the largest Aussie dollar trade ever issued by the bank. Now, more than 30 investors participated in that deal. The total order book was more than $598 million. The Australian dollar is the fifth currency in which the African Development Bank has issued so bonds ever since it set up that program in 2017 following deals in euros us dollars norwegian krona and the swedish krona as well on to south africa the country signed on to a plan to support its steel industry the department of trade industry and competition has said the so-called steel and metal fabrication master plan agreed to by the government and stakeholders in the industry that contributes roughly 600 billion rand or approximately 43.7 billion dollars to gdp provides a blueprint, according to the government, for the industry to re-energize itself and expand production. Now, that is according to the department. The plan comprises six priority areas, including addressing supply and demand side issues and agreements related to the African continental free trade area. An oversight council made up of 35 members of industry, labor groups and public sector officials has been set up to drive its implementation. In the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia has launched a tendering process for the proposed sell-off of a 40% stake in the state-owned carrier Ethio Telcom. Interested investors have a month starting from the 15th of June, effectively tomorrow, to submit the so-called expressions of interest. It's the first in a series of stages that will lead to the successful, to the picking rather, of a successful bidder. The sale in Ethio Telcom comes on the heels of a new telecommunications license awarded to a consortium that includes Kenya's Safaricom. J 
just last month. Opening up the sector is part of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's plan to attract a lot more foreign capital into the country and to maintain one of the fastest economic growth rates in Africa while creating a lot more jobs. Ethio Telcom generated revenues of $600 million in the six months through December and it has roughly 53 million subscribers. Oil prices are expected to decline next year to an average of about $64 a barrel, at least on Brent crude. But they expected to recover a little bit the following year to $65 a barrel before hitting $75 a barrel by 2026. If you're listening to that and looking at current prices and wondering where this is going, I don't blame you. According to Fitch, the US and China are expected to drive the global demand recovery in oil. But the ongoing pandemic crisis and the slowdown in vaccine rollouts are both expected to hinder oil demand in emerging markets. Oil prices have continued to hold near multi-year highs on Monday on an improved outlook as worldwide demand as rising COVID-19 vaccination rates help to lift curbs. Brent was up 14 cents, about two tenths of a percent to 72.83 at 123 GMT. It rose about 1.1 percent last week. It hit the highest since May 2019, 73 dollars and nine cents a barrel last week, Friday. Now, after a pretty volatile weekend, Bitcoin has again gone past the $40,000 mark. $40,669 was one of the highest numbers we've seen so far. It's effectively hit its highest level in more than a fortnight. The world's largest cryptocurrency rose by as much as 4% on Monday, trading at 40795 extending its rally to a second day. The coin has rallied by around 9% or so since Friday. The wider Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index, which tracks some of the major cryptocurrencies, also went up. It rose by as much as 7.7% at one point. Now, with Bitcoin crossing that $40,000 threshold, many charters are now looking at 42500 as the next important level to breach. That number roughly represents its 200-day moving average, and topping that could mean that the coin rallies towards $50,000. Cryptocurrencies have come under quite a bit of pressure in recent weeks. Bitcoin has lost around 30% since mid-April when it hit a record high of almost $65,000. Now back into the real economy. Egypt's annual inflation rate rose by half a percentage points to 4.9% in May, the highest level since December 2020, according to the official statistics agency. Now that increase was led by food, with food, fruit prices going up by 9% year on year. Vegetables are up 5.3%. Transportation prices are up by nearly 2% as well. The Central Bank of Egypt targets an inflation rate of 7% plus or minus 2 percentage points on either side by the end of 2022. Analysts at the Abu Dhabi-based ADCB Bank expect that the Central Bank will keep interest rates on hold in its rate-setting meeting on the 17th of June, with the lending rate remaining at 9.25% and the deposit rate at 8.25%. Now, Egyptian public and private sector workers have joined hands with the International Organization for Migration to start a new program to provide increased working opportunities for migrants in the country. The six-month program on offer includes providing apprenticeship for a preliminary 100 migrants who will be hired in the private sector affiliated to the Federation of Egyptian Industries. As Yasser Hakim now reports, the aim of the scheme is to integrate vulnerable legal migrants into the country's formal labor market. Saif Suleiman is a Sudanese who lives in Cairo and working as a journalist. He says it's been challenging to find good jobs amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the prior economic slowdown that affected Egypt over the last few years. The main problem Sudanese people face is the minimal job opportunities, and which, if available, are mainly in the informal sector, which is risky and not stable. Most of the available jobs go to locals as a priority to solve unemployment issues. This leads migrants to work in inferior jobs just to be able to pay for food, rent and daily expenses. There are nearly 6.3 million registered migrants in Egypt. The North African country has given special attention to the welfare of the segment. Some of the services provided by Egypt, although we are not a rich country, uh, we are providing uh, especially health services. It's extremely important. Before the COVID crisis, uh, and we were praised by WHO because we provided all her, uh, health services uh, in our program, Meet Million Saha, hmm, uh, to 
all people resident in Egypt. Now concerning the COVID, uh, all the vaccinations are for everybody. And for the first time here, a new service has been introduced to integrate migrants within the labor market. A six-month scheme sponsored by the Federation of Egyptian Industries has been developed to provide vocational training courses on the job training, followed by employment contracts to foreigners in Egypt. It is co-funded by the, uh, the IOM and the FEI, the Federation of Egyptian Industries. Uh, the costs mainly represented in the remuneration fees paid to the trainees. Uh, we offer them also meals, transportation, and there are also uh, f the fees of the training and traders. The ready-made garment, uh, it is a, a sort of industry which needs a, a, huge, a huge number of workers. So we are targeting big companies who have at least 1,000 workers. It is very important for them because economic empowerment, they lack economic empowerment of uh, the countries where they are in now. We are talking about Asia. Uh, it is not, it's not easy at all to find a job uh, due to lack of skills. So we, we offer them skills uh, and decent jobs. The federation, which represents companies from 19 sectors, says this program can benefit the local industries as well. Companies now is looking for um, a serious uh, uh, workers, and the reputation of migrants in Egypt, a good number of different nationalities of migrants in, in Egypt, is very good. Uh, so that the employers are seeking to uh, train them uh, based on their good reputation. And for Egypt, it's it's about time to um, get benefit from. Uh, the uh, presence of migrants in Egypt to uh, um, improve the Egyptian economy. The program will begin with 100 candidates, mainly from Sudan, Yemen, Syria and Eritrea. This is something to be commended. It's a very good move to help ease the burden of migrants in general. It's important to teach them the skills that are needed in the local market so that they can be productive. Organizers expect to expand the project further in the future, integrating more migrants to the local workforce. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. One last story for you in this segment. The World Health Organization continues to urge rich countries to donate part of their vast stockpiles of COVID-19 vaccines, which they're not using, to poorer nations. CGTN's Enoch Sikolia spoke to the WHO's Kenyan representative. This is part of that conversation. In the global race to inoculate people with COVID-19 vaccines, Africa is sadly at the back of the pack. <laughs> the outgoing World Health Organization, Kenyan representative Dr. Rudy Eggers, says Africa has barely gotten out of the starting blocks. And this is very important. The danger is to everybody. If you don't protect um, countries such as Kenya, and you get continuing uh, uh, circulation of that of uh, virus, it means that uh, variants can develop and even variants that then bypass the existing vaccine. So that's the danger. At 32 million doses, Africa accounts for less than 1% of the more than 2.1 billion doses administered globally. Just 2% of the continent's nearly 1.3 billion people have received one dose and only 9.4 million Africans are fully vaccinated. WHO says dose sharing is a do or die matter for Africa. It's really a call to those countries that are manufacturing and are purchasing these vaccines to share that with, uh, with Kenya and with Africa as a whole. Um, in the current situation, that is the, the quick fix, the thing that we need at the moment. Okay. South Africa, the continent's most robust economy, has only vaccinated 0.8% of its population despite having Africa's highest coronavirus caseload. That is according to a worldwide tracker kept by Johns Hopkins University. Hundreds of thousands of South Africa's healthcare workers are still waiting for their shorts. Nigeria has only vaccinated 0.1 of its over 200 million people. 
Uganda has been forced to recall vaccines destined for rural areas because it doesn't have enough to fight outbreaks in big urban centers like the capital of Kampala. The continent of 1.3 billion people is facing a severe vaccine shortage at a time infections are rising. WHO is also banking on China after Sinopharm vaccines were given emergency approval. The super economy from Asia has shown its willingness to help smaller economies inoculate their people. The Chinese production is actually relatively high, so it will mean that it would provide additional vaccines that we would previously not have. So it will help a lot. Billionaire British philanthropist Mo Ibrahim, who was born in Sudan, says the pandemic era phrase, yes. nobody is safe until everybody is safe, should be the rallying call at this time. And Oxycoli, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. I'll leave it there for the time being. Ahead on global business, however, we'll be diving into the world of cryptocurrencies, but from a country you don't often hear about, Tanzania. The president there signalled support, tangentially perhaps, for digital assets over the weekend, with the president instructing the central bank to prepare and not be caught off guard. What does that mean for crypto adoption in Africa, though? Or are we perhaps just reading a bit too much into that? We'll have some answers for you from 1800 GMT. See you then for now. Back to Beatrice. Rama, thank you. And we still have more news for you here on the program. Here's what's ahead. Hundreds of Chinese compete in Tianjin's largest ever dragon boat festival race. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panata, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. China is celebrating the traditional Dragon Boat Festival. A major part of the holiday are the Dragon Boat races, which take place all across the country. This year, the races in Tianjin have seen a record number of participants. Nicole Nga follows one of the teams as they hit the wave, the water, for the very first time. It's a risky business and much harder than it looks. Although dragon boat racing has been around for thousands of years, there are many for which it's still something quite new. Eamon Williams, for example, is usually the head of maths at a school in the port city of Tianjin. Today, he's a rower, having decided to finally take the plunge after watching the race for years. We asked what surprised him about the experience. How quickly your arms get tired. Although it's only 200 metres, which takes about a minute, but after the training and stuff, being on the water for about half an hour at a time, and you're going up and down, uh, yeah, your arms get tired pretty quickly. Then, he says, there's the challenge of rhythm. As soon as you fall out of sync with everyone else in the boat, uh, yeah, you slow right down. So, uh, yeah, we've got to concentrate on not necessarily trying to go as fast as we can, but staying in time. Keeping them in sync is team drummer Jane. Her arms mightn't get as sore as the others, but her job has its own challenges. The seat that you sit on is quite small, and, uh, and there's nothing for you to hold on to. So, so, and the boat is actually quite rocky. It's, it's, more, it's much worse than I thought it was going to be. So, yeah, the challenge for me is to not fall in the water today, hopefully. With those goals in mind, the team is feeling optimistic. In the boat, so we've, we've worked out the weights, so I think it's going to be balanced, so we should be okay. Uh, I wouldn't say we've been rehearsing really hard. We've been out once for about an hour or so, uh, and we need to take a break in the middle of that. <laughs> kind of have the aim of not to come last, but anything above that's a bonus, really. 
Tianjin has been hosting dragon boat racing for decades, but organizers say that this year they're seeing more competitors than ever. Around 500 people are expected to get involved. That means dozens of teams vying for gold. Many will be first timers like Eamon and Jane, but they say even if they don't finish on the podium, they'll be happy for having given it a go. If we leave dry, we won. <laughs> Nicole N, CGTN. Well, your sports news is coming up next. Do stay with us. How would you create your legend? On the fields. On the tracks. In the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene. Find 